Hello everybody, welcome to MNB World Talk Scoop. So this time we decided to invite a diplomat who lives and works in Mongolia since 2019. Please welcome uh, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary from the United States of America to Mongolia, Mr. Michael Stanley Klicheski. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, my <laughs> pleasure. How are you today? I'm happy to be here. We've been planning this for a while. Yes, and, uh, finally. Finally, <laughs> we're able to do it, so it's great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to ask uh, about your very first impressions of Mongolia. So any person, when he first ar arrives to any other country, of course, he gets some kind of uh, impressions, right? So yeah. could you please share with us with the very first impressions of Mongolia, your impressions, of course? Um, yeah, I guess so. My first impressions were maybe on two levels. So one was the personal level. Uh -huh. And very quickly, we met a lot of Mongolians, and we really were struck by how friendly people were. Mm -hmm. Even those that didn't speak the same language as uh, we necessarily did, but uh, we were very warmly welcomed, uh, mm -hmm. both at the embassy and in the community, but even among uh, Mongolians that we met, you know, even on the street sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, from that perspective, it was a very, uh, it was a very pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. Even from very, very early on, people had told us Mongolians are very, very friendly people, people. but uh, but it was quite really very true, and it struck us from the beginning, which mm -hmm. made us very happy, as you can imagine. And then sort of on the physical level, um, I, I have to say I've never served in a uh, predominantly Buddhist country, majority Buddhist country. So mm -hmm. seeing the, the, uh, the monasteries here, the temples, was really fantastically impressive for me. And it was something a little bit new for me. Not that I, have ever, not that I haven't been in uh, countries that have those, but mm -hmm. uh, seeing so many and seeing them really so impressive. Uh, struck us very early on. So I immediately began putting this stuff on Facebook and uh, uh, yeah. all my uh, friends from elsewhere yeah, were very, very, very intrigued. Facebook you know that because yeah, right. we're on Facebook, right? We're so. friends, right. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, you worked in the uh, U.S. Foreign Service for many years, right? So, many And years. how uh, do you find uh, living and working in Mongolia? How was it different to you? Um, oh, so we've... I've lived and we, we've lived and I've worked in uh, countries with very many, very different political systems, right. economies, mm -hmm. social structures, let's say, religious compositions. Yes. Um, so I, I guess one of the first things that I find uh, particularly appealing here is uh, something we always talk about, and that is, you know, people really here value their democracy. Right. Uh, it wasn't, it's not true everywhere that I've served, I will tell you. Um, but, but here it's very clear, and it's not just sort of the abstraction of democracy. I think people value the fact that they can speak freely, um, that they can say stuff on social media right. without, uh, you know... No without, limitations. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's a, that was a very important quality, and, and that's something, again, that was quite striking early on. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one, one feature of Mongolia that very much appeals to us. It also means that in my professional work, it's a little bit easier to have a, what's the word, like a political lingua franca with the, with the officials that right. I meet. Mm -hmm. So we don't always agree on everything, it goes without saying, but the fact that we're starting from the same kind of political structural base, mm -hmm. um, I think is very, very helpful. And then, you know, uh, it's not in every country that we're third neighbors, of course. Uh, this is the only country where we're called third neighbors, but uh, the third neighbor term really reflects uh, a desire by Mongolia to have close ties with us. Yeah, um, we're strategic partners. And strategic partners, right. right. And uh, again, that's something from a professional point of view that's very satisfying because, again, it allows us to build on that fundamental mm -hmm. relationship and expand it to very practical areas of cooperation. So I'm much more of a practical guy than I am sort of a theoretical guy. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the strategic partnership has led to all kinds of... Uh, uh, cooperation in many many areas, and and that's kind of what I think is uh, is particularly exciting about being about being here, and, and then just to say that uh, it's been about a little over two years that I've been here, yeah. but in that time, uh, our two presidents the, at the time was President Trump, uh, yes. with your president signed this strategic partnership. Yeah. So even before that, you know, the momentum had been very very positive, mm -hmm. but uh, it grew. It has been growing over the last. Yeah, period that I've been here, and we expect it mm -hmm. to continue growing. Uh, whatever mm -hmm. happens to uh, in your election, um, I mm -hmm. think the the situation will continue in the sense of close ties between our two countries. So, you know, from a professional point of view, that's a really cool thing. 
Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I see. Um, now I would like to introduce you to our viewers a little bit more sure. in the photos in a few sentences. Shall okay. we? Let's take a look. Oh, okay. <laughs> You had deployments in many countries, right? Right. And so uh, what was the country that taught you, let's say, the most important life lesson? Hmm, that's interesting, you should ask. Well, of course, the, uh, the deployment that had the biggest personal impact on me was actually my first assignment, uh -huh. because that's where I met my wife. So that was in the Philippines. Oh. <laughs> and I, of course, have a very close relationship with the Philippines mm -hmm. uh, because of that and for many other reasons as well. Uh, but in terms of life lessons, I think everywhere a person serves, everywhere a person lives, has a tremendous impact and a very beneficial impact. So I've been in, uh, uh, in countries where I worked on multinational issues, multilateral issues like the UN in mm -hmm. Geneva. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot up there about how to work on a multilateral basis. That's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a little different than working uh, bilaterally in a, in a bilateral relationship as I have most of my career. Um, I've worked in Iraq in uh, rather challenging times. In those mm -hmm. days, we had these things called uh, provincial reconstruction teams in all the provinces of, of Iraq. Mm -hmm. So doing that, I learned a lot, uh, both about working with military, mm -hmm. because uh, we were on a military base, um, and we were working with the primarily American military there. But it's interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. Little did I know at the time, but that was the base where, which had been previously protected by peacekeepers from, uh, from Mongolia. So now when I go to, uh, to meet Mongolian soldiers, it's not unusual that I will bump into somebody that says, oh, I was at Camp, uh, Camp Echo with you. Well, not with you, but at Camp Echo, and, and I have the same nice fond memories. Um, but, uh, you know, working in, in Russia was really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a very important relationship, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, uh, in every one of those countries, in different ways, uh, the key goal, I think, is to find common ground where you can, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's uh, something I tried to do everywhere, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so that creates these kind of life lessons: how to do that, how to um, find the right language, mm -hmm. both linguistic language, right. but even more kind of the emotional language that allows you to really see where you can cooperate. Where you can candidly disagree, because sometimes we have to candidly disagree with one another, mm -hmm. and how you can do that in a way that uh, sort of doesn't necessarily burn bridges, right? Let's yeah. put it that way, as we say in, mm -hmm. in the U.S. So uh, that's been a lesson throughout my life, and in every country, it's been a little different, obviously, but in every country, it's been uh, one of the most enjoyable parts, because that's what diplomats, among the most important things that diplomats do. But, but also, you know, diplomats... Uh, are supposed to ex explain their own country to the host country, including to the public. Mm -hmm. So again, the challenges are different everywhere. Some of it is literally linguistic. Right. Um, and I'm glad that I know some of the languages where I served. But, uh, but again, some of it is finding uh, themes that really uh, make other countries understand you mm -hmm. and you understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, uh, that I find very appealing here, you probably see it on, on my Facebook all the time, is I'm really fascinated with your culture. And uh, so highlighting your culture is kind of a theme that uh, is very important to me. And I don't do it because I'm a diplomat. I do it because I love it. But it does really uh, lead to sort of a, a mutual, a broadening of mutual understanding that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. And so what language do you speak? Oh, well, uh, I speak Russian probably the best at this point. Oh, wow. uh, I've lived, uh, we, my wife and I have lived in Russia, oh, a total of 12 years. Uh -huh. So it's a long time. It wasn't all in a row, but it was a long time. So uh, it's true that when you don't speak too much Russian, after a while it gets a little rusty. Right. But basically, I'm very happy that even here in Mongolia, there is some occasions when I can People speak Russian can speak, yeah. very productively. Right. And then, you know, my parents are from Poland and we served in Poland for wow. three years. So my Polish is a little rusty too, but essentially I can speak that as well. And my French is, is decent. And uh, thanks to my wife and her influence and her family and mine, um, I also speak some uh, Filipino, Tagalog as they wow. call it. So, uh, 
So these are all languages that, uh, I mean, I value all of them. Some I'm better at than others. Um, I'm working on your language, on Mongolian, <laughs> but uh, I don't have as much time to study as I'd like to. So How do you find Mongolian language? I find Is it, it difficult, difficult right. and I find it particularly difficult, I think, for... for phonetic side? From the phonetic side, you mean? From the phonetic, I'm working on it. Okay. But from the uh, grammatical and the structure of sentences, ah, I find it yeah. very difficult because your verbs are always at the end. In the end, yeah. And uh, it's a little hard for my head to get around that, <laughs> you know. But I'm working on the phonetics now, so <laughs> my ends, when appropriate, are becoming ings. Wow. Well, maybe you can test me out later. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> lately, I've been, uh, you know, watching uh, some Mongolian TV, and uh, oh, it's really? one way to learn, right? But, oh wow. Doesn't so mean I understand everything, but it's uh, but it's valuable. It's helpful, yeah, yeah. and that, that allows me to try to uh, what's the word replicate the sound. <laughs> I see, but um, but uh, you are here as an ambassador, right? Yes, correct. So could you please tell us what is the most difficult about being an ambassador in a foreign country? Oh, um, well, it's always important in a, when you're the ambassador. You have to be first of all the public face of the embassy. Um, it's difficult because you're always <laughs> the public face. In other words, right, you're always yeah. on. But it's also a lot of fun. I really enjoy the role of, uh, of being that public face, of uh, being on TV, as I am, yeah. uh, but really uh, articulating, representing the views of, of my country. So as I said earlier, I think one of the real challenges, I don't, know, I don't necessarily want to use the word difficult, but challenging, is uh, finding the, the right uh, way of explaining my own country, mm -hmm. which is different. Every right. country is different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, it's a little bit done by trial and error. Mm -hmm. But um, I think over time, I, I've developed a reasonably good way of explaining my own country, mm -hmm. and most importantly, how my own country uh, wants to expand its relationship with yours. Mm -hmm. um, so that's... It's a fascinating process. I think every diplomat's supposed to do that. Every diplomat does that. But as ambassador, you're kind of out front a little more. It's been fun to be ambassador. I, I'm not putting that in the past tense because it's still a lot of fun. <laughs> and I'm still doing this job and, and hope to continue for still a good little bit. But uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a great experience to do that. Until now, I was uh, the number two guy in the embassy in two previous embassies. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenges of that job are a little different. Mm -hmm. In that job, you tend to focus uh, first and foremost on the internal workings right. of the embassy. Yeah. You want to make sure things are working well. It doesn't mean you're not a diplomat uh, facing just, out oh, yeah. to, the, uh, to the community, but it also means that you've you got to make sure everything's working, everybody's happy ideally in an embassy, mm -hmm. um, that there's good relations between the American staff and the local staff. We very much mm -hmm. value in every country, we have a large local staff, and we, we're always going to make sure that they work, that there's harmony between the two, mm -hmm. and harmony within the whole mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit of a different challenge, and that's something maybe I do a little less in, in the embassy, but I think here uh, we have really good, I think we have a very high morale in our embassy, I like to think at least, and uh, it pleases me that, uh, that that's the case. Mm, I see. But uh, this year we mark uh, 34th anniversary of uh, the establishment of diplomatic relations between right. our two countries. But in your opinion, um, looking back at the three, last three decades, mm -hmm. what outcomes can you name of Mongolia-U.S. Uh, partnership? Mm -hmm. um, so throughout that period, uh, the relationship has been good because we value each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think as I can only speak really from the U.S. side, but w what we value about Mongolia is that it's a democratic country in a part of the world that where not every country is democratic, if I can put it that way. Um, so that's been one of the central, uh, I guess you'd say, themes. And that's one of the things that makes Mongolia uh, resonate in the United States, you know, mm -hmm. this, this country that really values its democracy. Right. Um, and the same thing is true of the free market. You know, free markets sort of shift in terms of the, the, uh, the liberalism or lack of liberalism of the economic structure, but essentially you have a, a liberal, you know, a free market here. And, yes. uh, and that's another important uh, element. That, uh, so I know early on the United States was very helpful to Mongolia at a time when, from everything I hear from, from Mongolian friends, People, yeah. it was a very, very difficult time here, right? Yes. In, the, in the 90s, early 90s mm -hmm. in particular. And I'm very proud that the U.S. played that role at the time. 
And uh, we continue, I think, to be supportive of Mongolia as Mongolia's own economy is, you know, has already gotten on its feet and is, uh, you know, is progressing. COVID uh, yes. <laughs> challenges for all of us aside. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think I can say is that there's been a kind of a steady prog progress in terms both of the, the depth of the relationship. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, we're doing more in the various areas, but also in the breadth of the relationship. So, for instance, we've expanded our relationship uh, in recent years mm -hmm. to cover things like law enforcement, which we hadn't uh, focused on quite as much in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a steady progress, sometimes uh, punctuated by bilateral meetings, because, you know, when presidents meet or, let's say, a president visits another country, it kind of is the central point for uh, expanding the relationship in some ways, you know. Uh, you're, you're expecting some kind of result from this meeting. Um, so that's been a phenomenon that has happened at times. I know it's, it's nice that President, uh, then Vice President Biden visited Mongolia. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And that was, you know, we always think about that. It's, a, it's actually very helpful in, in some ways in terms of uh, uh, an understanding and a focus on Mongolia even now. So, uh, you know, there's, there's been this cooperation all along, but we've always tried to find new areas uh, to expand it. The, the most uh, striking example now, I think, is USAID. So uh, AID has been here for a long time. In fact, they're, they're uh, celebrating their 30th anniversary here mm -hmm. uh, this year, mm -hmm. and uh, as is, by the way, Peace Corps. So, um, you know, with both of those efforts, with Peace Corps, it's been a steady presence of Peace Corps here, except in COVID times, of mm -hmm. course. And I know a lot of Peace Corps volunteers are, you know, really anxious to get back. Mm -hmm. And it's gratifying that a lot of Mongolians uh, know Peace Corps volunteers from the past. I'm always uh, amused or struck when, uh, when somebody says to me, I learned my English because I, there was a Peace Corps oh. volunteer in my, in my town, right? Yeah. Um, but at any rate, but on the a a USAID side, it's played an important role throughout, I think. Uh, but it's very nice to see that in the last year, essentially, USAID, which uh, was uh, reducing its presence here, has reversed course. So now they are uh, they're back here in a big way. We now have two American staff members that are mm -hmm. USAID representatives. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that momentum is a very positive one. Uh, in other words, a lot, across a whole range of areas... Uh, the relationship has been very strong throughout the peacekeepers on the military side, for instance. We've been very supportive of uh, peacekeepers. On the economic side, uh, focusing on good governance, um, things like transparency. Yeah. That thing we always call people-to-people -people relations, one of those diplomatic terms. But it's a real term, and it really means things like uh, ties between organizations of the two countries, people studying in one another's countries, mm -hmm. people learning English in this case in, in, uh, in Mongolia or going to the U.S. to study English. Yes. So it's been a steady and very uh, nice progress. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I can point to any single accomplishment as more important than yeah. all the rest. Rather, I would say it's really been wide ranging and uh, mm -hmm. very, very positive. And it's got a nice momentum, I guess, to it that I think is important as well. Yeah, we are really thankful for what the U.S. does for Mongolia. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we're really thankful that we have a partner like Mongolia, I must say. It's, uh, which is uh, actually, you know, in some cases been extremely helpful to us as well. I mean, we, we didn't forget, we don't forget that Mongolia, at a time when the we U.S. was struggling forget. with its COVID, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, gave a uh, million dollars worth of uh, PPE equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it was partly a symbolic act, no question about it, but it was also partly very, you know, a significant substantive act that, that was very helpful to us. So it's a partnership both going both ways, and we, yeah. I think we both really appreciate it, and that's genuine. I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's just sort of diplomatic talk. Yes. I think there's a real, yeah. there's real substance to it. Now I would like to uh, have a look at the, our next part of our program, which is dedicated to your work. Now let's take a look at another part okay. of our program. I've been a diplomat for quite a few years now and I'm very happy that I made that decision. So I guess there were two or three factors that were involved. First of all, I'm very proud to be an American and I really uh, am happy and proud to represent my country. That's true. I think all American diplomats, probably all diplomats, are, are patriotic and proud, right? Um, 
but I also very much enjoy uh, interacting with other cultures, with other people. And uh, as I said earlier, I think, trying to find common ground, even with all the cultural differences that, uh, that countries have. And I think it's very satisfying when we can find that common ground and use that to advance the relationship between the two countries. So that's another reason I enjoy it. But I also have a very personal reason, and that is it's fascinating to live in other countries, to meet people from other cultures, to learn a lot about them. And that's why I do the stuff I do, go to museums and monasteries and so forth. It's a nice opportunity. And as a diplomat, you know, we also get to meet fascinating people, people that I probably wouldn't meet uh, if I weren't uh, in this capacity. And that's a really neat thing too. So I've met presidents, I've met athletes, I've met uh, all kinds of people that I just feel incredibly honored to have uh, had the pleasure of interacting with. And uh, that's probably, if I'm counting, the third reason uh, that I really enjoy my, my career. And it's nice for the fact that our kids uh, have also been exposed to the world. So um, they are very much Americans, but in many ways I appreciate the fact that they also understand the world and can interact with people from different cultures as well because they've been raised in this uh, sort of uh, environment. So it's been a great decision. I'm very happy about it. Could you please share with us with the most interesting, curious story that happened to you in Mongolia? Um, well, there's all kinds of things that I find amazing. And it's not unusual that I come home and tell my wife, goodness, you know what happened today? It's mm -hmm. funny things. And uh, some of it is because I've come to know a lot more, a lot of people about now. So it's really pleasant when I bump into somebody I know. Um, for instance, it was just two days ago, I guess it was, or a few days ago, that uh, I was walking past Sukhbatar Square. Okay. There were a lot of people there oh, yeah. because it was the uh, award ceremony. Yeah. The president was giving awards. Yeah. And I just kind of launched into the crowd to see what was going on. And I was so surprised at how many people I knew there, uh, personally. Uh -huh. And once you know one person in Mongolia, it's very nice that they introduce you to all their friends. Um, so that was a really cool story, and I came back, you know, I was sort of really, it, it kind of motivates you yeah. when you, uh, first of all, know people, feel like you have a lot of friends, but by the time you leave, you know, you have even more friends, so, so that's a really nice thing, and, uh, yeah. but, but I guess one of the funniest stories of all, some people may know the story, is, uh, you know, I go to the barber, I go to a very simple barber, and not, uh, <laughs> nothing very sophisticated, but uh, a barber that I've gone to from, from the first time I was time. here, from, from my first week here. Um, and quite literally, if I can tell the truth about this, um, I was walking along Peace Avenue okay. uh, when I first got here, and not really knowing that much about Mongolia, but I knew I needed a haircut. And uh, all these barber shops were closed. Oh. And then one barber shop was open, open. Yeah. so I just walked in there, and I've been going to them uh, loyally ever since. <laughs> anyway, much to my surprise, a few months ago, I guess it is, I suddenly see on, uh, on social media the story about me having uh, been at the barber shop and a, a woman and her... Uh, With your photo. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody came in and I said to them, you know, you can go ahead of me because I'm usually not in a big hurry. And somehow that, uh, that really resonated, <laughs> both that, with this person who wrote the story. That place must be very popular since then. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it was a really funny story. The truth of the matter is, I, uh, I didn't really realize at the time that I was doing anything special. I was just uh, being nice <laughs> to somebody who, was, uh, <laughs> who, was, who wanted to get a haircut or, uh, ahead of me. So. But it was very nice. That's a, that's a nice story. But really, the more you live in a country like this, it's a friendly country and a friendly city, the more these kind of things happen. Yeah. So um, um, just recently, I was, I was walking uh, around the embassy, and I suddenly bump into somebody who tells me that they, uh, they're a cultural figure oh. uh, who's been performing uh, throughout the world. And I was quite surprised, pleasantly surprised about that. And I, I, you know, a 
wrote my kids on, oh. uh, on, uh, on Facebook, God, you know, look who I just met. So it, it's kind of a funny thing. It happens yeah. with amazing frequency. Most of the time. It happens pretty <laughs> often. I'm, uh, yes. And it really makes for a nice experience, I have to say. And you often uh, walk around, you'd be with your wife, uh, Mrs. Eloisa yeah, Klicheski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, she's really stylish, really <laughs> beautiful woman. Oh, and, thank you. <laughs> and I'm really interested uh, to know, um, could you please tell us the story of how, how you met? Oh, how you guys gosh. met, yeah. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> we, we met in the Philippines. Um, she was in New York when, uh, for most of the time that I had my first assignment in the Philippines, mm -hmm. working at the United Nations. But then she uh, she came back for the for the New Year's holidays, Christmas holidays. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it's a, it's a long and elaborate story, and she always tells it better than I do. But I think the most uh, noteworthy part of the story is... We should ask her too. <laughs> you can ask her too, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but the most per noteworthy part of the story from my perspective is that uh, um, her family and my family conspired. My parents were visiting me at the time. So when we were introduced for the first time, the first time we laid eyes on each other, we were introduced as husband and wife. Mm. So they said, Michael, this is your wife, Eloisa. Eloisa, this is your hus <laughs> husband, Michael. They all thought it was a joke, but within, I think, two weeks, we were engaged. <laughs> really? <laughs> so that's the, that's the most dramatic part of a very long oh. and elaborate story. But I think that's kind of unusual, isn't it? So, yeah, certainly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone actually anticipated that. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah. But we'll definitely ask her to. Oh my goodness! Okay, yeah. from another angle, you know. From another angle, is right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I would like to take a look at, at the next part of our sure. program, which is dedicated to your hobby. Okay. Walking around. You. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That is my hobby. Yes. So for me, I really love to go to museums and uh, places like this, and whatever is beautiful and interesting places can I, where I can learn stuff. And there's a lot to be done in Ulaanbaatar. Um, and I'm so glad that uh, in the time of, uh, after COVID, things are beginning to open up. So that's really important from my perspective. And when you think about the history of it, as I often do when I come here, um, it just, it astounds me how uh, interesting and uh, symbolic it is. It's nice that uh, our government, through the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation is uh, helping to uh, restore, preserve Mongolian culture. By the way, it's something we do in many countries throughout the world, but in Mongolia we've done a lot. Um, we do it often in uh, uh, historical places or in museums, and in fact all the major museums here, the large ones, we've, we've uh, contributed to all of them. But this is one great example. So. Uh, this is one of 20 projects, basically, that we've done. The total amount is something like $1.2 million. So for this particular project, we are restoring the Yadam Temple. It's a structure that uh, very much needs restoration. We did this, in, of course, in, co in coordination with the, with the museum authorities and with the city and national authorities, um, and also with the Arts Council of Mongolia, which is an organization that we very much value and have worked with and which has done a broader renovation of this uh, area with, with uh, some private support, private sector support. So here we are uh, doing a, a major renovation of the Yadam Temple. Um, we actually brought a, an American expert on restoration of these kinds of structures, of historical structures here, to uh, give us, the, uh, give us and, and our Mongolian colleagues the expertise on how to do this. Um, and he was super excited, in fact, about the whole project. And I'm quite certain that he's uh, really anxious to come back as, uh, when the opportunity presents itself to see how, how it's proceeding, what needs to be done, further detail. But anyway, we will soon be actually starting the work of uh, renovating this beautiful uh, Yadam Temple. American ambassadors all over the world have the privilege of bringing American art to their residences. And here is the example of the art that I brought, my wife and I brought. Um, so this is a famous uh, Korean-American artist uh, named Nam Jun Paik. He is considered the father of video art. In fact, in the Smithsonian Museum American Art Collection, his work is among the most popular. 
And uh, you can see that he uses video uh, relics, shall we say, of the videos of the 70s and 80s and his old TVs as one example of the kind of creativity that he displayed. And what we like about it really is that it reflects the remarkable creative uh, burst of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, um, and you can see some of it here. We're very fond of this art, very proud of it. We have other American art as well, but uh, in some ways uh, this is perhaps the best known of what we have. So I guess you are a very busy person, so how do you find time for your family? I'm busy, but I, uh, of course, you have to find time for your family. And I just make it a point. I think most people uh, make it a point to uh, break away from their work. I have to admit that uh, to the extent I, you know, I try to share sort of the bright moments of my work with my family as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if there's something I can kind of share with them, uh, I will be happily doing that. And they know that I get a lot of satisfaction out of my work. But I also, I have to say, one of the things that I like to do is kind of uh, share things I learn. So I learn a lot of stuff when I'm working, mm -hmm. but I also learn a lot of stuff when I'm walking around a famous walker. Right. Um, and I really like to share that kind of thing with my family. So with my, of course, my wife is here. My kids uh, uh, have right. only visited a couple times, and we're uh -huh. hoping they'll be visiting again soon. But, you know, you just have to you just have to do that and it's very important and it's very satisfying. So we have Zoom calls. I suppose many, many viewers uh, do the same kind of arrangement where they have the regular Zoom calls with their families, particularly their families somewhere else, mm -hmm. particularly in a time of COVID when uh, you, know, you, know, you can't see each other physically that very much or sometimes yeah. at all. Um, but um, it's just vital to do that. And uh, if you only focus on your work, you're gonna lose perspective on life and uh, I think that's a huge mistake. So yeah. I, it's, an, you know, it's something I think that comes naturally if you just uh, make it, you internalize it, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Now, do you spend more time with your family due to the COVID? Um, well, I'm at home more, uh, particularly before I was at home when we were all in lockdown. Um, and I always uh, joke that it's a good thing that my wife and I like each other because... Uh, in time of COVID, you better like each other because you're home, a, home <laughs> together, together a lot. Right. But yes, yes, of course, it, uh, it means you're home a lot more together. But, uh, you know, even from home, I work and she's got all kinds of things that she's working on as well. So uh, the two of us somehow find a harmonious way oh. to, uh, to do this. And, and it's important, obviously. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to uh, not have that uh, aspect of my life. It would, be, it would be very unfortunate. But, we, you know, we share a lot of... Uh, the same interests and the same joys. She likes to meet people, so I introduce her to my friends and, yeah. and vice versa. When we could, we love to go to the theater here in Ulaanbaatar, as everywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something you just carve out the time. There's just no way you're not going to do that. And honestly, in a way, I always think that I'm learning from it as well. So, you know, this you always want to be learning more because yeah. you're always going to be a more interesting person and a uh, more interested person if you just keep learning. So the two of us share that sentiment. Wow. I think, I think my ki our kids also share oh. that sentiment. Yeah, I see. And my last question will be dedicated to your dream. Do you have a dream? What dream do you follow right now? Oh, um, no, I think what you were talking about with family and uh, just having personal satisfaction, but being satisfied that the people that mean something to you also have both their own satisfaction, but are also kind of growing personally, emotionally. I guess that's a kind of a dream that I have. Um, I don't necessarily want to climb uh, Mount Everest or anything, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of the, the people that mean a lot to me, I think, are, are my dream, that they be happy and that they, uh, that they get a lot of joy in their own lives mm -hmm. and that I am able in some way to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's a, maybe it's a vague dream, but it's an important one, I think. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your thank coming you. and for yeah. your time. Thanks a lot. It's I really fun. appreciate it. And it nice was a really big honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Me too.
So ladies and gentlemen, today we had Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary from the US to Mongolia, Mr. Michael Stanley Klicheski. We will see you next time. Until that, please stay safe. Thank you.